The new fourth gen Intel Xeon scalable processors are absolutely awesome with more cores, more accelerators, DDR5, PCIe Gen 5, all kinds of features. But one of the big challenges is efficiently cooling that performance and that new capability in a 1U chassis. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is the ASUS RS700E11 RS12U. I did that on one shot. So cool. And this is Asus's newest 1U dual socket Xeon server. We've been reviewing a ton of servers on STH over the last couple weeks. And one of them that I wanted to get to was this one because I think it's super cool. Even though this is a 1U chassis, what you're gonna see is that we get performance that's very similar to 2U and we actually got power consumption lower than one of the recent 2U servers that performed about the same all in this 1U chassis. That's not really supposed to happen, but that's exactly what Asus managed to do here. Quick game plan for today, we're gonna to take a look at the server, starting with the outside, we're gonna walk through the server as you see it in front of me, and then we're gonna talk about performance, power consumption, a little bit about management, and also our key lessons learned. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so starting with the front of the server, we're gonna see something that's a little bit different. The first thing uh, is just the drive phase. Let's kind of go pull out a drive here and you're gonna see that we have a two terabyte NVMe SSD. But because we have 12 bays, one of the challenges is just the front panel space. And so what you'll see is that a lot of times there are different designs for trays in 12 bays versus if you have a 10 bay chassis. And so one of the things that ASUS does here that I'm actually not the biggest fan of, but I understand why they have to do it, is that these trays do not have sides, which means that they're not toolless. You have to actually screw in the SSDs. So it's a little bit harder to service, but on the flip side, you get a full 12 SSDs. And one of the other challenges is just frankly getting airflow through. So I think that that is one of those trade-offs that just has to be made in order to get enough airflow through. And we're gonna see the impacts of that as we get inside. Now let's go to the back of the server, which is about 842 millimeters or about, I think like a little over 33 inches deep. And one of the first features that you're gonna see back here is that we have power supplies. These are dual 80 plus titanium, 1.6 kilowatt units. I really like the fact that ASUS has titanium power supplies. We just looked at a uh, another large brand server and they had platinum power supplies that are 1.4 kilowatts. So always uh, always like the efficiency, especially in a server like this, we're gonna be using over you know a couple hundred watts and most likely a kilowatt or so these days. Now, in terms of IO on the server, you get something that's totally special. First off, you get a power button on the back. So you don't have to go all the way to the front. If you're on a you know hot aisle, you can just go hit power. And then next to that, you can see that there's a postcode LCD screen. And that actually tells you like, here's your postcode. That may not seem like it's a big deal, but if you do have a server that you're turning on, you wanna make sure that it's actually getting to the OS and it's actually booting, that's pretty useful. And it's also useful if you have something that like reboots because of, you know, like a memory module fails or something like that. And like something reboots the server and it doesn't come back. It's really easy when you have a stack of these to see like, okay, this is at a different postcode. So this must be the one that I wanna look at. We used to have stacks of ASUS 2U4 node servers. And what you saw was like, you know, every once in a while one would fail because of, you know, um, usually memory module actually. And, and you would see that it would get stuck on the postcode. And so you could see these things and you know, there's two rows of them uh, all the way down and you're seeing like, okay, that's the one that has an issue. And it's really easy to just go troubleshoot at that point. Next, you get a VGA port and two USB ports for local KVM management if you're in the data center. And then there's a management port. Now the management solution here is an ASUS ASMB uh, IKVM, this is, a, this is the ASMB 11, so this is their newer generation one. Then the really cool one is the RJ45 ports. These RJ45 ports on servers these days are still very often one gigabit ethernet NICs, but on this server, they're actually 10 gigabit ethernet NICs. And the 10 gigabit solution that ASUS is using is actually pretty high-end because this is an Intel X710 10G base T, not like an X, you know, 500 series. So I think that's just kind of cool. It does use a different, uh, you know, NIC driver and stuff like that, but it's also kind of a more modern solution. So I kind of like the fact that Asus is using that here. It's also nice to just have 10 gig built in because you can always run it at one gig, but if you want to go run faster speeds, you can. A lot of times onboard networking in modern servers is really used for things like management and control planes. It's not necessarily used for your like high-end networking. High-end networking goes into other card slots. And so let's get to those next. Now, when we look at the risers, there are two risers, but there is a special feature here because when you look at the back of the chassis, you might see, and you might say, hey, there are only three PCIe slots, but, but that would be incorrect. So taking a look at the first riser, this is kind of cool here. So you're actually gonna see that we have the first PCIe by 16 slot, and this is a gen five slot. And then you're gonna see the little LOM that has our RJ45 ports. 
Asus has different options if you know you want to go do that, and they have these like different modules. So if you need something different, I guess you know, and you're buying a lot of them, you can probably call up and figure out what the other options are. But that's kind of how Asus has been doing a lot of their modern servers. Now the other riser has two PCIe Gen 5 by 16 slots. So there's a lot of PCIe connectivity, even though this is only a one U server. I mentioned earlier that there was a secret slot on this and there definitely is. So if you see this slot right here, you're gonna see that it sits behind the networking slot. And you might wonder like what this is. And so this actually sits in the middle of the server right here. And the design of this is that this is an internal slot. So if you wanna have things like a, you know, they call them pipe controllers, which is Asus's Broadcom SAS controller. Uh, if you wanna have one of those, you can actually put it into the server here and you're not using one of the rear IO slots. So you don't have to use one of the ones that you might be using for like a, you know, 400 gig NIC or something like that. You can instead use that internal slot for your SAS connectivity. But now let's get inside the server and see all the rest of the stuff and how it works. So we just talked about the internal pipe controller, but something that is different with this server versus a lot of other servers that we've been seeing is that not only can the front drive bays handle NVMe, but they're also wired to be able to accept SATA right out of the box. Now behind the back plane, we have a fan partition. This fan partition has a whole bunch of dual fan modules, and there are a total of nine of those in the chassis. Four of them are for one side, four of them are for the other, and then this little piece right here sits over the dims and actually splits the final and ninth fan. One other thing I wanna point out real quick, because this is a change if you had like, you know, like a Cascade Lake or Xeon 5 server or something like that. Something that's a little different here is that we have a lot more front IO in motherboards in this generation. So you're gonna see that we have like front IO right here, which is an MCIO PCIe Gen 5 slot right here. And you're gonna see that we have the NVMe cable or the PCIe cable that goes to our NVMe storage right like this. The reason that that's all important is because with PCIe Gen 5, you a lot of times will have to go over cables and your sh runs have to be a lot shorter than they were in like the PCIe Gen 3 generation. And so you're seeing more motherboards have PCIe up front and on the like front of the motherboard versus just on the back. But those NVMe cables go over what might be my favorite feature of the server. This is something that we are seeing more and more of these days as another design point, which is the cooling solution. Now the cooling solution has something that looks like a normal 1U just kind of heatsink fan unit. And this literally looks like the heatsink fan unit that if you told me that you know, this part right here was out of like Cascade Lake server, Sky Lake server, I'd say, oh yeah, that makes sense. But the cool thing that it has is it actually has these heat pipes and these heat pipes go in like two different planes. And then there are these two little dog ears that are here and those sit directly in front of the fans. So the idea is that your airflow comes in, it goes through the NVMe bays, it gets heated a little bit from that, but then it goes through these high power fans and then you get pretty cool air directly on these little ears. And then in the middle, it goes through the main heatsink portion. And the reason that you need such a cool cooling solution is because this uses the fourth generation Intel Xeon scalable processors, codenamed Sapphire Rapids. In this generation, they go up to 350 watt TDP, which is a pretty massive jump over the Ice Lake or third generation Intel Xeon scalable. So because TDPs are going up, but also core counts and all that kind of stuff, that means that we have to have cool cooling solutions. Now, if you wanna learn more about the fourth generation Intel Xeon scalable processors, we have an entire guide to that. We have an awesome video as well. We'll link that in the description. But in that, we go into all of the things like accelerator options, because depending on the SKU you have, you can have things like 800 gigabit quick assist for crypto and compression built-in accelerators on these chips. And there are a ton of other options in terms of accelerators, and some don't really have many accelerators on them. One that is pretty popular these days is that these new processors have Intel AMX, which is Intel's new AI inference extension. And one of the cool things about this ASU server is that this can cool the entire range because it can go up to 350 watts. So we've actually put the 60 core Plat Intel Xeon Platinum parts in this server and it actually worked. And more importantly, not only did it work, but we also got performance on those 60 core units, just about what we got on the 2U server. Some 1U server designs that we see are not able to go and cool the high-end CPUs. Now we've already talked about the PCIe Gen 5, We've talked about the higher core counts, the accelerators, all that kind of stuff. But one thing that we have not talked about is the memory situation. Now this is kind of a funny one because the processors themselves have eight channels of memory, but you can run two DIMMs per channel. This has been a big thing in the industry where folks have been saying like, oh, Intel can do two DPC, but AMD can't do two DPC. We have an entire piece, if you've heard that and you wanna kind of learn more, we have an entire piece kind of debunking some of the weird things that people have been saying online on that. But the big thing here is that we have eight channels of memory, 2 DPC, which means 16 DIMMs, 
per CPU. The memory runs, if you're a 1D PC at DDR5, 4,800 speeds, assuming your processor supports it. And because we have two processors, it means you get a total of 32 DIMM slots. So if you wanted to just use a bunch of 32 gig DIMMs or 16 gig DIMMs, I don't know why you do 16 these days, but if you want to use 32 gig DIMMs, go for it. And behind the CPUs is the rest of the IO. First feature I want to point out is that you actually get two M.2 NVMe slots on board. So if you want to go put boot drives, you can do that. They're not accessible from the outside, but on a 1U server, I guess it's a little bit more challenging to have something like that. And also SSDs are so reliable these days that that is pretty common that we're seeing them just on the motherboard. Other key features you're going to see here is that we have the Emmitsburg PCH which is the Intel, I think, C741. And then we have a couple of little things, like we have a micro SD card slot. So if you still are using micro SD cards in your servers, you can do that here. They used to be a lot more popular a couple of years ago. And then the other feature that you'll see is that we have the A-Speed AST 2600 management. That a -speed controller is what is our ASMB 11 IKVM solution, which gives us our out-of-band management and IKVM functionality. One other fun feature is that Asus is using a pretty interesting connector here. So you can kind of see the connector, hopefully you guys can see this, on the riser and uh, it's labeled as a Gen Z connector. It is actually Gen Z, not a Gen Z, um, you know, the, the server does not support Gen Z, but it's labeled as a Gen Z connector. It has one of these little blocks has PCIe Gen 5 by 16. And Asus is using these not just for the riser, which is what you see here, but that cable goes into the same connector. Okay, so let's get to the performance of the server. Now, one thing on the performance, I just want to call out because somebody's going to obviously have seen this, is the fact that when Asus sent the server, they sent uh, things like they only had one DIMM for each of the CPUs, which means that you're only getting like one eighth of the memory bandwidth. So, of course, uh, you know, we did a whole piece on DDR5, and we're using that DDR5 in here, so that way we can, uh, you know, get actual decent performance out of the system. We also installed some of our Platinum 8452Ys in here because those were chips that we've used in other server reviews and we just were doing these all at one time. And so we said, okay, why don't we go put these in and we just get a comparison between them. And when we ran a number of workloads, I just wanna show you this real quick, that the performance of this is actually very close to what we saw on both the Dell PowerEdge R760, which frankly was very surprising when we get to the power consumption. The other thing that we saw though is that it was also pretty close to the Phoenix Nap bare metal cloud solution that we looked at when I installed installed my own server. But let's talk a little bit about power consumption and why that matters. So the reason I think that that matters a lot is that the power consumption on this when we were running at idle was in like, you know, a little over 200 watts. The Dell PowerEdge R760, even though it was a 2U server, the idle on that was running at over 600 watts, which we showed. And that was due to more aggressive BIOS settings. But it turns out that this system was very competitive with that R760, even though it's a 1U and it was using less power because it had less aggressive BIOS settings. So I think that there are two things that are going into that. The first is just how efficient this cooling solution is and that's why we spend a little bit extra time in this review going over the cooling solution. And I think the other part of this is that this has 1.6 kilowatt 80 plus titanium power supplies. The Dell had 1.4 kilowatt 80 plus platinum supplies. So these power supplies are a little bit more efficient than the Dell ones. With that, let's get to our key lessons learned. In every server review, I love to have something that we learned in a server. So I think there are like two things that probably uh, stick out to me in this server. The first one is that I, frankly, uh, it's been a long time since I've had to go and actually screw in SSDs. So we had to go do that here. And that's just something that I, I wish that these were toolless. I understand why they're not because this is a 12 bay solution, but, and you need the airflow. But on the other hand, I just kind of love toolless drive bays these days. Thank goodness though, that SSDs are so much more reliable than hard drives because that means you're just not swapping them out as much. My second key lesson learned though is on the cooling of course. And I just really like this like kind of ear configuration. Now some vendors will actually put the ears behind, but this seems to work pretty well with these just massive heat pipes. So one of the things that we're seeing in servers is that I just love all the really funky cooling solutions and this certainly has a pretty funky cooling solution, but as funky as this might look, it was actually very effective. Overall though, this is not a server that's designed for like maximum number of GPUs per server, maximum amount of storage, and especially doesn't have any three and a half inch storage in here, let's face it. But on the other hand, what it does is it has pretty much everything you need. It has a bunch of storage up front. It has three PCIe Gen 
five by 16 slots in the back. It has 10 gig networking built in. You could put another card here if you wanted. It has M.2 for your boot SSDs. It has 32 DIMMs, two processors. I mean, what else do you really need in a server these days? And the fact is that this worked not only in the configuration that Asus sent, but it also worked in some of the other configurations that we ran, including with you know more DIMMs and also different CPUs and all that kind of stuff. So overall, we got to test a lot of stuff in this and it worked pretty well, so I really like that because some servers are temperamental, this one was not. Hey guys, I hope you like this look at this Asus server. If you did, well, we have other Asus server reviews that we've done videos on. We have more on the STH main site. Go check those out. We have a ton of great content. And if you did like this video, well, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we have great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.